Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. All right, good evening. good evening. We had a short lesson this morning. What I didn't tell you is I'm going to take that time back tonight. <laughs> this actually is a lesson I was set to deliver back in January, actually on the, the weekend that we ended up canceling services because of the weather. And so um, I've had this one sort of uh, on standby for about a month now. And again, if you would like an outline, those are out on the table back there, and um, you can get, get one of those. In chapter 6, uh, Paul had concluded, or as we're studying through 1 Corinthians, in chapter 6, Paul had concluded with admonishing the Corinthians to flee from sexual immorality. And then here in chapter 7, he's dealing with the topic of marriage. And as I said, as, as we're studying through 1 Corinthians, this is not going to be a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. We're not going to uh, go through and discuss each and every verse, but look at some of the main ideas in each chapter. And um, I'm going to spend at least two weeks on chapter 7. And um, today what I want to look at or I want to think about is that sometimes the teachings of this chapter have been misunderstood. And in some cases, this misunderstanding of really what is being taught has led some to actually have incorrect views about marriage and come to the conclusion that to be unmarried is, uh, is more holy or is a more faithful Christian lifestyle than to be married. And uh, that's what I want to, kind of what I want to address today. Now, as we begin to look at this chapter, uh, first of all, I want to start by thinking about a, a, another topic, and that is context. Context, context, context. In order to correctly interpret any Bible passage, the context of the statements that are made must be considered. The definition of the word context, it means the circumstances that form the setting for an event, statement, or idea, and in terms of which it can be fully understood and assessed. When we study scripture, we need to stop and consider the setting for the statements that are being made in that chapter in order to correctly discern the meaning of that. This includes what I call the immediate context. In other words, in the actual chapter, the verses immediately preceding and the verses immediately following this passage that you're studying, you need to consider that context. But it also, I believe, includes the remote context. And what I mean by that is... Uh, the biblical teaching on this topic in other places. We, we know the Bible does not contradict itself, and so when we come across a difficult passage on a given topic, we need to remember the remote context, remember the teachings of the Scripture, so that we don't take this difficult passage and by misinterpreting it, cause it to contradict uh, another passage in the Bible. Part of this context, taking things in context, also involves asking the question, uh, how would the original audience have understood this um, when they read it? And that will help us, I think, to understand better. Now, I have a couple examples of this, and I'm going to make a statement now that um, some of you will immediately agree with this. Some of you might say, wait a second, what are you saying? The statement is, do you realize that not everything in the New Testament applies to you, applies to us as Christians? We have to keep things in context. And one good example of that is Mark chapter 16. In Mark chapter, okay, Mark chapter 16, uh, beginning in verse 17, we have a statement made by Jesus. It's, he says, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. 
Now, there have been people who take this passage out of context and understand it to mean that this promise here that is made by Jesus uh, is for all believers for all time. We, we know that there are people, uh, um, we question their sanity maybe, who, you know, like to handle snakes. And they do that because of this passage. They can take up serpents and uh, they will by no means hurt them. But if we stop to consider the immediate context, we realize that these abilities that Jesus was discussing were for the purpose of confirming the word. Because if you just drop down a, another couple verses, we read, They went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. And so we know from the immediate context that these signs that Jesus was talking about um, were his way of helping them and confirming what it was they were teaching, these abilities to do these miraculous things. Now, that's the immediate context. The remote context of the Bible, we could make arguments that and show scriptures that show that miraculous gifts were temporary in nature. They were never intended uh, to go on for all time. We could also show passages that show that these miraculous abilities had to be bestowed by the laying on the hands of the apostles. And of course there are no apostles uh, today. And we could also show that the word has been confirmed. Therefore these miraculous gifts are no longer needed. That's the remote context. So when we consider the context of the statement made. It helps it to make sense for us. Another example would be Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. Here we have Jesus saying, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now again, some taking this passage out of context, to context conclude that Holy Spirit baptism still occurs today. And that this type of baptism is actually, some would even say, a requirement for one to be a Christian nowadays. However, the context of this statement in which it was made tells us that Jesus was actually talking to his 12 disciples. If you look back at Acts chapter 1 and verse 2, um, it says, Until the day he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen... And then it is to those apostles that he is speaking when he tells them that um, they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so context helps us to understand that. Why do I talk about context? Well, the context of 1 Corinthians 7 will help us to understand exactly what is being taught here by the Apostle Paul. We need to look at the immediate context. In other words, what statements are made within this chapter that give us insight or better understanding in regard to what Paul is teaching. And we need to ask the question, to whom was Paul speaking and under what circumstances was he writing and talking to these people? And then we also are going to consider the remote context. Uh, what are the Bible's other teachings on the topic of marriage? And uh, Paul's statements... In 1 Corinthians 7, they're not, they're not going to contradict what the Bible teaches about marriage in other places. And so we're going to consider the remote context and also the immediate context. And actually, I've chosen to do these in reverse order. We're going to do remote context first and see what the Bible says about marriage. And then we're going to look at some statements within the text, in the immediate context, that show us what it was... The, the situation that Paul is dealing with, and then we're going to look at well, what really is being taught then. So the remote context, what does the Bible teach about marriage in general? And again, we, we, could, <laughs> we could make a series out of just this topic alone, but we're just briefly going to summarize. Marriage was instituted by God for man's benefit. Therefore, it's a good thing. In Genesis 2 and 18, God said, after he had made Adam, but before he had made Eve, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And then you drop down a few verses to verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So contrary to what many believe, 
Marriage is a good thing. It's an ideal setting in which to bring forth the child into the world where there is a loving father and a loving mother uh, to bring that child into this world. God would not have given us this institution of marriage if it was not a good thing. And so there are many people in the world today who look at marriage as the old ball and chain analogy. And, and, you know, why would I want to enter into a relationship like that? They know so many people who have um, had failed marriages and been unhappy in marriage. And they, they have a very negative view of marriage. But really, marriage done the right way, which is a, a man and a woman who first are loyal to God... Uh, and then loyal to one another, it's a wonderful thing, and it's a good thing. And God has given us that for our benefit. Further, the scriptures teach that this union uh, of marriage, is in, it's intended to be one man and, and one woman for life. One man and one woman for life. Matthew 19, 4 through 6. He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said... For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So one man, one woman, for life was God's intention all along. The Bible teaches in, in, in the remote context of the idea of marriage, the Bible teaches that marriage is an honorable thing. Hebrews 13 and verse 4. Marriage is honorable among all. And we've been talking for the past four weeks or so about the leadership of the church. We've been talking about elders. We've been talking about deacons. And God's favorable view of marriage can be seen in the fact that both bishops or elders and deacons are to be married men with children. Now again, if God thought that um, the married relationship was a less spiritual um, condition than being unmarried, why would he make that a requirement for leaders in the church? But yet, in regard to bishops, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 2, the husband of one wife, in regard to deacons, verse 11 of 1 Timothy 3, their wives. Okay, so uh, the... Uh, it is clear that God considers marriage a good thing, even preferable, in that uh, the leaders in the church are expected to be married men. So, as we go back to 1 Corinthians 7 now, any interpretation of 1 Corinthians 7 that causes it to co contradict these other very clear passages, we know that must be an incorrect interpretation. The Bible holds forth marriage as a good thing, a good institution, not as something that is less spiritual or somehow an inferior person uh, is one who is married. So let's look now at the immediate context of 1 Corinthians 7 that gives us a hint uh, as to what exactly is being taught here. So there are a couple statements that are made, actually three verses I want to know here in 1 Corinthians 7. Um, first is in the very first verse, 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Paul says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So Paul is dealing with this topic in answer to some questions that they had sent to him in a previous letter. There was something going on in Corinth or in the church at Corinth that made them want to know if it was advisable for men and women to get married. Now, we're not told exactly what was going on that made them want to know this, but there was something going on in Corinth that made them wonder, uh, is marriage a good thing? Is marriage wise? Now, you drop down to verse 26, and this, I think, is actually the key um, here. Because Paul says... I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that is, it is good for a man to remain as he is. So he's talking about a present distress. Now, we said something was going on in Corinth that made them question whether marriage was good. Paul now tells us in verse 26, there was 
some kind of distress, there was some kind of persecution, some kind of trial going on in Corinth that um, Paul says, because of this, it's better to remain as you are. There was some kind of persecution, some form of trial. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But that statement, I think, is key to understanding what he's getting at in this chapter. And then drop down two more verses to verse 28. Paul goes on and says, But even if you do marry, you've not sinned. If a virgin marries, she's not sinned. Now notice, nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. So this distress, whatever it was, um, would have been worse for a married person than for someone who was not married. So Paul's instructions here in 1 Corinthians 7, in this context, are, it's for the purpose of sparing the Corinthians trouble in the flesh. Because of some form of persecution, some form of trial that was going on at this point, Paul is saying here, if you're not married, it's better to stay unmarried. If you are married, it's okay. If you need to get married, it's okay. But if you can control yourself, it's better to not be married for this present distress. And I just got ahead of myself and sort of did the next point right there. What is being taught here in 1 Corinthians 7 then? So the immediate context is there's some present distress. And... Um, we have to keep that in mind. If that distress is not present, if that persecution is not present, then what Paul is saying here doesn't really apply. Okay? So, because of the present distress, he says they should remain in whatever state they are already in. Verse 20. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. If they were married... When this distress started, they should stay married. If they were single, he says you should stay single. You look at verse 27. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. All of this in the context of this present distress. Whatever state you're in, he says it's better if you stay in that state. Because of this distress... He hints at several times that being unmarried was actually uh, preferred, preferable. Again, verse 1, concerning the things which you wrote for me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Verses 7 and 8, he says, For I wish that all men were even as myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner, another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good if they remain even as I am. Paul was unmarried. So he's saying, if you remain as I am, it's good if you, can, if you can stay that way. Verses 32 through 34. And I know Steve read this, but let's, we're just emphasizing. I want you to be without care, he says. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin, the unwoman, where, unmarried woman. Uh, carries about the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit, but she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And then in verse 38, So then he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. So again, because of the present distress, he says it's actually preferable to not be married right now. Now, one of the ways that New Testament Christians were often persecuted in the first century, in the second century, was that they were often shunned by the community, okay? And as a result, they often could not hold jobs, okay? Nobody would hire them to do work. Many times also in the marketplace, the vendors, the sellers in the marketplace would not even sell to a Christian, because of this fact that they had been shunned by the community. Now you can just imagine that in such circumstances, what a brother or sister might be willing to do in order to feed their family. Now if you have an unmarried man or an unmarried woman, they, you know, it, it, well it certainly wouldn't be easy it would be a lot easier for an unmarried man or an unmarried woman to deal with this but if you're thinking about a married person, and maybe even a married person with children, 
Imagine how much harder it would be for a husband to watch his wife starve to death. Or, heaven forbid, for a husband and a wife to have to watch their children suffer because of this. And so it's the idea of, you know, you're going through some persecution. If you can control yourself and not be married, it's probably better, Paul says, because if you are married and if you bring children into the world, you're going to have trouble in the flesh. That's what he's talking about there. And he says, I just, I would spare you of that. I want you to be aware um, of that. So it's, in my mind, it's, it's easy to understand why Paul would advise them not to, ma- not to marry under these circumstances. However, uh, if they were single and could not control their sexual desires, Paul makes it very clear in four different verses throughout this, this passage that it is okay to marry. He's not saying it's sinful for them to marry. It's okay. It's permissible. You do well, he says, if you marry. Verse 2. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Verse 9. If they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Verse 28. But even if they do marry, you have, even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh. And then verse 36, but if any man thinks he is behaving improperly toward his virgin, if she is past the flower of youth, and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does, he does not sin, let them marry. And so he's very clear, again, that marriage is permissible uh, under these circumstances or in this situation. So as we think about just... I guess this sermon kind of has been more about what is not being taught in 1 Corinthians 7. Paul is not suggesting that marriage is a less spiritual relationship than being single. But when we keep this in context, we realize that there was some kind of distress, some kind of persecution upon the Corinthians, and Paul wanted to spare them some of the trouble. And... uh, As a result, he says it's probably better if you can manage to stay as you are. If you're married, stay married. If you're single, stay single. If you're single and you can't stay single, it's okay to marry. Uh, You're not sinning if you do that. Because throughout the entirety of Scripture, marriage is upheld as an honorable and a godly institution. So any interpretation, and, and this really, chapter 7, is is one of the passages, I'm sure, that the, um, the Catholic Church would use to argue that, you know, an unmarried man is more spiritual than a married man. And, and therefore that is part of the basis for their not allowing their leaders in their church to be married men. But that's really not what is being taught here. This, this persecution, uh, this distress is not, it, it, we, we're not suffering it um, here today. And as again, as I said, realize that not everything that is said in the New Testament applies to you and me. Sometimes there were specific situations that set forth principles um, that needed, that we still should follow those principles today. But Paul is not saying that there's anything wrong with the institution of marriage. Now, again, we need to spend a little bit more time on this chapter. We're going to revisit this again. Um, probably in a couple weeks. Next week I'm going to do my um, Costa Rica report on Sunday morning. Um, So probably in two weeks we will revisit this and we're going to talk more about marriage and actually we're going to discuss marriage, divorce, and remarriage because that is mentioned um, in this chapter and there are some false teachings that come out of this chapter where people have misapplied uh, what is taught here. So we appreciate your attention. and Hopefully this has been helpful uh, in regard to this topic. By way of conclusion now, we always take a moment to offer an invitation. If there are any here who need to obey the gospel of Christ, certainly we would love to see you do that this evening. God would love to see you do that. If you have not yet been immersed 
for the remission of your sins. Understand that Jesus died for you. He paid the price for your redemption, but he requires something of you. He requires that you believe in him, that you turn from your sins, that you confess your faith in him, and that you be immersed in water, that your sins might be washed away. If, if you've not done that, as we sing the song we're about to sing here, you can come forward and you can obey the gospel this day. If you've already done that, but have since fallen into sin and once more and you need to repent of that, we'd be glad to pray for you. Or if there's anything else we can do, we encourage you to come as we stand and as we sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.